the way that I think about consciousness, it's like a library. And when you're a kid and you're a baby, you have a pretty open library, but you go through life and you start to encounter different ideas, different experiences. And all of this is like information and energy that gets added to this big library. And then we basically use that library to respond to life. A lot of the stuff in that library is actually very unhelpful and covers up the truth about who we are. Hello and welcome to Polyweb. I'm your host, Sara Landi Tortoli, and my guest today is Scott Britton, founder of Troops, a company acquired by Salesforce, and the host of the Evolution FM podcast. In this conversation, we explore Scott's journey through entrepreneurship, his spiritual awakening, and how to effectively manage a busy life with mindfulness and listening to your own intuition. I would keep a note on your phone and write down every single time you get disturbed. So every time you feel anxious, anytime you feel upset, anytime you're taken out of peace, So Scott, I like to start my podcast with a question that goes along those lines, because I think it gives like an insight to listeners about, you know, the guest. And the question sounds like this, what should I know about you and your background to understand where you are right now in your, in your journey? Yeah, I think my background for the first 30 years was very very kind of like follow the american dream you know very achievement oriented i i grew up as an athlete i wanted to be a professional professional athlete i i was a, a football player i went to princeton university which is you know, usually ranks the first or second best university in the States, was an athlete there, left college and became an entrepreneur because that was kind of the, the cool, successful, sexy thing to do. And so I did that. And about eight years ago, started a couple different things. But eight years ago, was I started my most recent company, which was basically a workflow automation company called Troops. What that company did was it helped people interact with databases like their CRM or marketing automation. So things like Salesforce, HubSpot, Zendesk, do all of that within chat platforms like Slack and Microsoft Teams as kind of this future of work technology. And yeah, I did that. That business ended up selling to Salesforce, which is the fifth, fifth largest business software company in the world. And, you know, it was kind of one of these experiences where five years into that company, I, I kind of had done, I felt like I had done everything right. You know, I went to the right school. I was successful. I had the best body of ever, all my friends. I had the most f- friends and women in my life, all these things that, kind of culture told me that would make me happy and would give me a good life. And yet I was pretty miserable. I was pretty just like exhausted from my perfectionism. And yeah, about five years into that company, when I turned 30, I was pretty burnt out. And I basically opened up to the idea of doing a plant medicine experience for the first time. I had a very profound experience. At this point, I had been meditating for six years, but it was very much a practice oriented towards stress management at that point in my life. Didn't really have any depth beyond that. And after the plant medicine experience, you know, I it kind of felt like I had a veil pulled off my eyes of like what reality is. I became very interested in exploring spirituality and consciousness and maybe there's more here and all of a sudden business success, those things just became kind of 
increasingly less interesting. And I think the big thing that happened to me was three or four months later, I had this thing called a Kundalini awakening, or basically you have a very intense energy shooting through kind of opening up and beginning to move through your body. And this isn't a, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, I had some shakes, like that's Kundalini. It's, that's actually, it's actually quite different. Like this is really a, a process that does not stop for, for, you know, for me, it's been going on for five years now. Some people it's a couple months, some people it's decades, but basically that process is very physically intense. And the intention of the energy is to purify the, the energy and information in your consciousness. And I didn't know what was happening to me with this weird physical change. And I started to kind of do all the Western medicine and figure out what was going on. And no one had any answers for me. And I did brain studies. I did all these things. And ultimately that led me again back to spirituality where it was really the first time, first place that people could tell me what was actually happening to me. And so, yeah, I have been just going deeper down that path for the past five years and doing it while running a business and and you know we we ultimately we sold that business a year and a half ago and so i feel this like pretty deep calling to be someone who is pursuing the greater depths of consciousness and the humor human experience but is also a person in in the working world you know, is someone that is what yogic traditions would call a householder. And I think that this is becoming increasingly important because a lot of people are going through various forms of spiritual awakening and it's turning over their life and they don't know what they should do. They don't know if they should leave their, they have to leave their job. Do they need to go work in something, become a healer, like go to an ashram, like all of these things. And there is actually, there is actually a middle way. There is a way to use everyday life, every moment of every day to evolve your consciousness. And that can be done in any context. And so I'm, yeah, that's kind of what I feel like my mission is. I'm writing a book on this topic. I have a Substack and a podcast myself. You can find my Substack just by searching my name on Substack and my podcast is called Evolution FM. And I think we're just in a really interesting time as a species where more and more people are having these experiences and starting to question who they think they are, what reality is, what is what are the potentials for human life. And trying to figure that out. And so I'm really just another person trying to figure that out and sharing what has been helpful to me and my experiences with the goal of serving others. Thank you for, for sharing that so openly and so transparently. For the past year, I've been on a, on a similar journey. And right now, I'm kind of struggling to figure out what's next for me. This, is, I think, is the first time that I speak about it uh, openly in public. But I've taken a pause from my my job largely for the past year. And because I had the space, you know, I started what I what I think of as my a year for for to heal, basically, like this healing journey, largely brought about by meditating consistently at least uh, one hour and a half every single morning. Most days it's like is between two and three hours every single morning. I, I you know, did other things, not just uh, meditation, plant medicine as well, 
regular journaling, uh, therapy, coaching. Like I tried many, many different things. And right now I'm at this point in which I'm, you know, need to go back to be an active member of society. <laughs> Let's put it like this, you know, and figure it out what's next for me. And I'm kind of struggling to reconcile how do I keep this this space and this spirituality alive while I go back to be a fully embedded member of the productive society. I'm seriously like going trial and error to see you know what what fits to this new me right Uh, because things that were acceptable before and that I thought I wanted are not the one that I want right now or they don't feel uh, like as important uh, and other things are more important uh, and therefore this there is this balance between being uh, like sort of type a high achiever you know type of personality with is it's okay like letting go and be more more at peace uh, if you want I think that's a false polarity, personally. I think, you know, I I definitely have some questions for you about, maybe we start there. So what are you, what parts of spirituality are you afraid of losing by going back into the working world? I'm afraid of losing the space that is needed to allow myself to open up to to really emotions and what I'm feeling and what I think of my as my inner light. Because I realized to to meditate and to really arrive to that level, at least for me, you need you need like emptiness. You need to be able to switch off the monkey brain for a period of time that is long enough for allowing this to come up. At least this is what it feels like to me. You know, I'm not sure what's anyone else experience with this. I think everyone has, you know, the thing that's fascinating about consciousness and spirituality and kind of what we're talking about, everyone has a unique experience and unique journey. Like I can't sit here and tell you like, oh, you should do this because I'm not you, you know, and my path is different than your path. And there's like 8 billion paths. But what I've, what I've seen in my own experience and other people's is that meditation is like the entry ticket to the game. Like if you're peaceful for 20 minutes and then frenetic and an asshole for, for 23 hours and 40 minutes, like, okay, cool. You, you, you've experienced what spaciousness feels like. You've touched a part of your inner, deeper self, which is a spacious awareness. And the goal, so you've had exposure, and the goal is to embody that state permanently. And the way that you do that is the practice expands beyond the cushion. And it's why many yogic masters and gurus would send their students out into the world after a couple of years. They would say, okay, you know what? It's like, it's time for you to have, to grow in your wisdom and grow in your practice by being a person and a participant in the world. Because you're not really serving if you're sitting in a cave, unless you're you know, a very high being that can change the energy of the planet. And so, yeah, I think like you're at an interesting, you're at an interesting juncture. And one of the exemplars that comes to me that had a similar experience, have you read any Michael Singer's work? Yeah. Surrender Experiment? I think like, like the untethered soul and living untethered, like, like behind there. Like I have like a book, I like some books for people that are listening to the podcast just behind me. So yeah, they are there. Yeah. I mean, he's a great example of someone that's like, all right, I'm going to meditate my way to enlightenment. And what he realizes is that the meditation has its limits. 
And then he needed to learn how to use life as a meditation. Mm -hmm. And so that's really been my experience and practice, which is the way to, the way to remain the way, I, I guess like the way to remain as that spaciousness, as you move through life, what I have found most helpful is to notice become the watcher of when I get pulled out of that, that spaciousness, because what that's indicative of is some type of usually subconscious inner material that has been animated by the world around me. And so a great example of that is I could be sitting at my desk and feeling this urge to be productive. Like I need to get done. I need to get done. And What's really interesting is like the spacious does if you're the spacious awareness like does the spacious awareness need to get be productive no the the true self is is eternally at peace and ease it's completely content with how things are and what that consciousness pattern is that you're experiencing in your awareness is really just some type of energetic information that is that is driving your thoughts. And so maybe you had a experience as a kid that made you feel like you weren't enough. I mean, this is what happened to me. And all that productivity is actually the ego's way of invalidating that lack of enoughness. And so what happens is, is you see there's some type of like distortion going on in your awareness. And then you, you go into it, you go and you sit, sit with that. And what that does is it gives you an opportunity to free yourself from being in future experiences and feeling these compulsions that you didn't choose. You know what I mean? I think that's the funny thing. It's like, a lot of people, everybody thinks they have free will, but yet there's this invisible master that subjugates everyone to inner feelings, thoughts, and ideas that they don't like. And so do you really have free will or are you really just a responder to a vast unconscious that you didn't choose in many instances? So yeah, you know, I think like, you know, that that experience of like, how do I kind of expand the meditation practice to become, to turn life into a meditation, I think is just like, it's a very natural common trajectory that many people on this, on this path experience. Do you have any, any prompt or questions that you, you go through when you see something happening or arising within you? What does it look like for, for people that would like to start doing the same. I would keep a note on your phone and write down every single time you get disturbed. So every time you feel anxious, anytime you feel upset, anytime you're taken out of peace, basically what that's indicating is, hey, there's some unconscious material that is being activated right now. And so you, you, you make a list and maybe, you know, each day, I mean, look, I still do this. I've been doing this for four or five years. Like each day you take those things, like I'll pull out my list right now of this is what happened to me in the past 24 hours. I was frustrated on a call with someone yesterday. I compared myself to someone. I showed a sense of arrogance around someone else's behavior, kind of like spiritual judgment. Like, oh, that's like really not. There's a, there's a judgment I noticed. And then I noticed that I was identified with the thoughts, which is kind of maybe something that's a little bit more abstract. But I take these experiences that are essentially indications of me being taken out of spaciousness, out of identification with just the awareness. And you go and you sit, you sit with them. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to access the underlying imprint. So the way that I think about consciousness is like, it's like a library. And when you're a kid, 
and you're a baby, you have a pretty open library, but you go through life and you start to encounter different ideas, different experiences, emotional, emotional experiences. And all of this is like information and energy that gets added to this big library. And then we basically use that library to respond to life. And a lot of the stuff in that library is actually very unhelpful and covers up the, the truth about who we are. It's like we're, we're walking around with a garment that we think is us, but it's not actually us. And so each time you encounter one of these disturbances, it helps you see, hey, where is that? There is some information here that is basically taking out of taking me out of the spaciousness awareness that I truly am. And so you bring that into meditation and you the goal there's there's this scientific actually proof of this called memory reconsolidation of all of the studies that have been done scientifically with behavior change and psychology and transformation, this process is actually the only one that has scientifically been validated to result in permanent behavior change, permanent transformation. And the process is, is basically you need to access the underlying emotional energy, which means like have a felt experience. So you need to kind of almost relive or really feel that thing. And when you do that, the neuroplasticity, I mean, this all happens at an energetic level higher than this, but I think it's helpful to ground some of the teachings in the physical, physical, physical scientific realm that a lot of people are familiar with. Basically, the neural passageways open up to a state that is conducive to rewrite, to basically rewrite the library. And at that point of experiencing, you can actually insert new information. So you can insert, and you want to do this in a felt way, like, like feeling love or feeling trust or feeling spaciousness. And what that does is it actually deletes that old memory and inserts that new one. And so, so, so the, so the full process that I do is I'll basically like to get pretty tactical here, you know, I'll revisit that memory and I'll access it of me getting frustrated on the call yesterday. And I'll usually say something out loud, like, why can't you just get it? And I'll, I'll drop into my body and somatically I'll feel the tension of where that energy and information is. And as I do that and sit with it, you can literally feel your inner space start to open and start to experience spaciousness, which is basically kind of a signal that, Hey, this is, there's, there's an opening now. And sometimes this can take 30 seconds. Sometimes this can, you know, I'm kind of riding the energy wave for like 30 minutes plus, and eventually you'll feel some spaciousness. And at that point you can insert however you would like to feel right? That is aligned with the qualities. I call them open heart qualities, which is from my wisdom school, Ren Shui, but the, the qualities that are more aligned to the true self, which are things like trust, openness, unconditional love, unconditional gratitude, unconditional reverence for life exactly as it is. And, you know, every day life gives you many, many opportunities to do that. Think about all the little times where you've been taken out of peace or frustrated or resisting what is. I mean, it's like constant. And as you start to notice these things and work with them, you're gradually changing the underlying composition of your consciousness. And what you'll notice is, is that many of the things that used to take you out of peace, that used to take you out of that moving, living meditation no longer do because there's no underlying information that's getting animated by the outside world like it once did. And so, you know, eventually you're kind of just 
watching the movie, you are permanently or more permanently or increasingly the observer of the experience, including your thoughts and reactions, which is what you are in meditation, except you're moving through the world. And so it's a very, very rich experience to work with life that way. And I find it to be very, very thrilling, like, you know, because like what you see is life just gives you opportunities constantly. And every time that you choose to work with them, your life gets better. Your inner experience gets, gets better. Wow. Okay. So many things to, to go back to. And thank you for sharing this perspective. I actually have not considered that day to day life it is actually full of opportunities to, to work on yourself. Right. I guess that what I'm afraid of is that I don't feel yet strong enough in my, in my journey to deal with all those inputs at once. But I want to, I want to go back to the very start of your journey because I think this could be of a particular interest to, to listeners. And I would like to go back to the moment where you realized that things needed to change. Do you remember exactly what you were going through at that time? And what were the, th the first action step steps that you started to take at that point? Yeah, there were kind of two things that stick out to me, like two moments. One was my mother said to me, you know, kind of like, what's happened to you? Like you used to be so like, you used to like joke around, you know, you used to be so carefree in high school and growing up and you're like, so intense. And that was kind of like a, whoa moment for me because I knew she was right. And I also had this experience where I was dating someone and we went to a therapist and the therapist basically in not so many words said like, you don't feel comfortable like choosing the things that you want to because basically like I was in this relationship that deep down, like I didn't really want to be in, but I like thought I was a bad person if I, like, I thought I should be in it, you know, like this person's objectively amazing and everybody likes her and, you know, we have a good time together and like, but like, I wasn't all in, I wasn't fully in. And I thought that something was I, I thought I just like wasn't allowed to, that wasn't okay. And this therapist kind of highlighted to me, like, you don't know how to like do what you want. And I was like, wow, you're fucking right. And so like, those were two kind of moments of change. And I don't, I don't think it was like, wow, that moment happened. And then I did X, you know, they were more just like signs that like my program that I, everyone told me was working for me because I was like having success in the outside world was just not working. And, you know, I, I, I gradually and slowly started to accept that and try to, and try to change. But it, I mean, it, it, you know, it, there wasn't, there's no quick fix here. Like, this is just the journey, <laughs> you know? And yeah, it's it's probably one I'll be on my whole life. I, I agree with you that once you start, it's not like there is an end. <laughs> At least that's also my experience so far. It's like, it's it's something that you start and then just, you know, follows you along on for your entire life. But at that point, uh, 
when you had this realization and you came gradually to accept that this is what it, what was present for you, what did you start to do? What what things did you start to change or to add to your to your life? Because I guess that what I'm asking for is for listeners who are kind of in a similar situation as the one that you described that you describe right now. What are the first things that they should start doing or thinking about? You know, I just think maybe a big thing is like to start to shift the external orientation inward, right? Like if you read if you're reading books and watching things on like how to be successful and like how to be healthy physically and how to have the perfect body and like all of these things like that are basically kind of like, Oh, like a good life is out there. You know, it's, it's, it's not focused on creating abundance within in how you feel on a moment to moment basis you know, there's many different ways to explore that, but I would just start to explore that. And for me that like, I had already been meditating for six years at this point. And so it wasn't like, oh, I started meditating. It was more like I started to shift my gaze of the information I was consuming, the books I was reading, the podcasts I was listening to, to be oriented towards the inner space. And as I did that, you know, you start to just encounter different things, encounter different practices and different curiosities. And I think part of it is just an experimentation process of just trying different things and seeing if they resonate and, you know, going from there. Yeah. You... During you know the introduction, you mentioned something that happened to you, and you called it a Kundalini awakening. Can you explain what that is and what it looks like? Yeah, so the like. There's, it's kind of exists in many different traditions. The word Kundalini kind of comes from the more yogic Vedic traditions, but the idea is that we all have this latent life force energy that is used to basically bring us into life. It's, it's what spurs the, the union of a sperm and egg to grow into a being inside the body energetically. And after we're born, it basically becomes dormant. You know, it kind of gets just turned, turned off. And it's like this latent potential that most humans uh, just don't even know about. Like I had never even heard the word before. And traditionally, as one evolves spiritually, uh, that energy can reawaken. And there's actually processes in certain traditions where the, like a master or or yogi, when a student has been amply purified and the body and mind has been purified, they will basically do what's called a Shakti pot and awaken this energy within the student. And the, the goal of the energy is to basically purify the entire energy system, nervous system, and, and connect someone with the divine intelligence and consciousness that it reveals the truth about who they are. It's like a, a transformation process, both physically and energy, energetically. And in some cases, this can actually happen to people when they haven't gone through kind of like the step-by-step process of working with some type of, you know, tradition. And that's what happened to me. You know, I wasn't seeking this out. I didn't know about it. 
it kind of just happened after psychedelics and it has been very for a while it was very very confusing because what it looks like is you basically can feel inside of your body energy moving and you like shake almost which is indicative that there's some type of thing obstructing flow and yeah that was happening to me five to 15 times a day every single day for for many months and years and gradually i've learned to work with it but basically it's kind of moving through me and doing cleanup work and it feels very physical there's lots of pressure and the energy is an intelligence it kind of knows exactly what needs to be experienced and so when these tightnesses and different things come up in my body you know it's a pointing to go into them and oftentimes there's information such as past experiences stored emotions that need to be faced and accepted and eventually loved and so that's that's what kind of kundalini is and you know i'm still in my process so like i can read about i can tell you about what happens next and later but like i just really don't you know from direct experience perspective like i just don't know because i'm not there yet so okay thank you that's helpful you mentioned that your your experience with psychedelics and plant medicine in general like what what that what does that experience look like for you and now would you suggest listeners approaching it if they're interested i think you know plan planix plant medicine is like it's like a, an occasional condiment you know of a of a small like of like a much much bigger spiritual meal the the purpose of psychedelics from my perspective is you know they're non-specific amplifiers to things that are in your consciousness and so they help you experience those things that need to be met and in many instances open up your perspective to a bigger reality but like as many, many, many people that have kind of went on this journey, you know, Ram Dass was one of the original examples, like you go on the ride and then you get off the ride. And like, I think what everyone wants is to experience the feelings that they want to feel all the time, permanently. And like, I think psychedelics can motivate one to develop the practices in order to reach that place, but taking psychedelics on its own, you know, they might help you with like a little bit of this, like a, a little burst here, a little burst there, but it's, it's not going to result in the embodied change without all of the work. And so like, you know, this, the psychedelics, like for on my own journey, like they helped me get started, but like, I don't, really use psychedelics now i don't really care to i i've there's lots of unintended consequences of using plant medicines that i have experienced you know having your field open having all of these kind of energies that are not yours entities like there's lots of shit people don't talk about that happens when you take plant medicine that many people that many people have to deal with afterwards. And so I don't have a problem sharing that because I think people should know, you know, people treat it as like a panacea of healing. And it's really just not like they're, they, they can be helpful. But at the end of the day, like everyone talks about integration, integration is just developing spiritual practice. It's like integration, which means embodiment, like being that person that you felt on the experience, the way to get there is through working on the consciousness through developing spiritual practice. It's not doing 50 ceremonies. When I meet people that like, 
it's kind of like dating apps. Like the goal is to get off the app, you know? And so, and my, my ayahuasca shaman who you lived in Peru and studied with the lineage of, you know, wasn't one of these like therapy person turned shaman. Like he was a real shaman was like, yeah, the goal is to not obviously not do this. And different people have different timelines for that. But, you know, it's, it's a, I would say tread lightly, but if, if someone's doing like 50 sits or whatever, it's like, all right, is the medicine really working? <laughs> you know, but that's just my opinion. What do I know? Yeah. I mean, like psychedelics and plant medicine feels like the Russian roulette, you know, you don't know what you're going to get or what is going to come up and be careful because be careful what you wish for, you know, that that's also my experience in this realm. You, you talk about spiritual practice or practices. Do you follow like a specific one or what does those spiritual practices that you talk about look like if you're, if you're open to share? Yeah. I mean, spiritual practice is like a very broad thing. I would say the way that I think, what is spirituality? I think it's connect, you know, strengthening the connection with something bigger, right? Something, the divine, the life force that animates everything that you see. And so there's many different ways to do that. And for me, what does that look like? I mean, I've tried pretty much everything, but what's stuck is the practice that we went through, which is, you know, using my response to life in order to evolve. And I bring that into meditation. I've recently restarted doing Qigong, which is basically like moving energy, moving chi into the body so that there's not any deficiencies, there's less blockages and working with that, you know, I have a dedicated practice where I basically commune with my higher self. And so I bring questions to the stillness and I get information about how to live my life and I follow it. You know, it's like, I, it's kind of like my whole life just feels like a big spiritual practice because I'm just like watching it all unfold, noticing when I'm resisting, surrendering to that, going inward, following the directions that life and my higher self brings into my awareness. And that's kind of just, I'm just kind of along for the ride. What happens when this awareness pulls you in a different direction compared to where you are right now. How do you, how, first of all, how do you become aware of that? And what do you do at that point? Well, I remember when I was on plant medicine, I experienced a voice in my awareness that had a very distinct texture it was, it was like I was having a conversation in my head with another presence and that presence seemed to know everything about me. You know, it seemed to know things that I didn't. And what ended up happening to me is a couple of years ago, I started to realize that I could access that presence in meditation. And this is kind of a natural byproduct of basically the consciousness purification, because that presence is always there. It's just so obstructed by all of the imprinting that basically keeps people in ignorance about who they really are. And so I started to, yeah, just like ask questions and work with that information. And then 
what you realize is intuition, like the spontaneous type of insights is really just that presence making itself known. And that's like, this is like your soul. It's like your, it's the eternal you that is always there, always in the inside. And so as you start to do the consciousness purification, it just starts to become a more dominant contributor into the information in your awareness. So you have like these thoughts that are emanating from the ego that have a certain kind of sound almost like a certain quality, a certain texture, a certain type of content. And then you have this other type of information that is, you know, much more eman an emanation from the divine part of you. And, you know, you just have to, you just have to learn, like you will recognize it when you have access to it. And then you have to learn to work with it, you know, and, and learning to work with it is just learning the different textures. It's like, oh, I know what Steve's voice sounds like and I know what Sarah's voice sounds like. And so it's easy for me to recognize them even if I'm not looking right at them. And the same happens with the contributors into your consciousness. And so what starts to happen is you do start to get directives through these contributors, through the higher self, as well as through life itself that basically say, hey, go go left when you want to go right. And at first there's lots of resistance there because the ego likes to think that it knows best. And there starts to be this process of learning to follow that inner voice and then good things happening. And good things can be great outcomes in the world or they can be really important experiences for your growth. And eventually what you realize is that you don't know shit. Like your ego is like a child. It's like a kindergartner. And it has a very, very thin slice of reality that it draws from to make suggestions that is oriented around survival, which is very different from an orientation around your highest expression, the highest potential for you as a being to to contribute in and participate in that and what you see. And so eventually, yeah, the ego, you kind of see what's going on. You're like, wow, like all the like go left signs from the ego are actually just like try to survive. And like, this is like a little child. And this go right information is much more aligned with my highest good. And you get, you get verifiable evidence of that through learning to trust that higher source of information. So, you know, just that resistance phase is natural. And for me, it's like, I don't make a meaningful decision without consulting my higher self. Like I, 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 like I asked if I should join this podcast, you know, and it's the intellect is like so limited and small and just from a bunch of inherited ideas that I didn't even choose. So versus the true self is operating from total information, eternity. So like it's, it's, it's a process, like it's been a multiple year process to learn how to navigate that and work with that. And it's actually something I teach people. I have a course called guided intuition, which is all about how to gradually start to move in the direction of working with the, the inner intelligence. I see. I was about to ask you, how did you, how do you tune into it? Like, how do you? Um... It's not a, it's not a, like, it's, it, it, it's an emergent, it's, it's emergent. So like, it's the way to think about it is like this. You, there was this, there was this, the show on Netflix called ancient apocalypse and on the show, they were looking at this big mound. It just looked like a big mound. And under that mound was actually a very, very elaborate, amazing temple. But it had been covered up by dirt and vegetation and plants. And so it's like, it was always there, but you couldn't, you couldn't access it. You couldn't even see it. And so the process of tuning in is is like removing the sediment of that's obstructing what's already there 
it's not like, oh, say these words and this happens. It's like layer by layer, gradually moving all of the imprints that are obstructing that divine part of you that's always been there. And so it's really, it really is emergent versus that, that has to do with lots of the consciousness purification work versus like some technique. It's like, it's not, you don't get it by a technique. You get it by healing your consciousness. Okay. Interesting. It, it reminds me of what I was telling you earlier that if you dug, you know, beneath all those things that are clogging what's naturally there for you, which might be anything from stored emotion uh, that are unreleased trauma. There is this inner, inner light, this inner voice that we all have. I want to go back to what you were saying about managing like a life with a full schedule, you know, with plenty of responsibility, successful under, under any Western standard and, you know, balancing with your, your spiritual practice on a day to day basis. What does it look like for you? Like what's your, what's your schedule or what are the things that are non-negotiable for you that you always make sure to make time for? Yeah, I think like a lot of people with the stuff they think they get into this polarized thinking, like either or thinking with like, oh, well, I can be a spiritual person or I can be a productive person in the world. And you actually can do both. And what hap productivity, the way productivity happens is it just changes as you grow spiritually, like we can talk about that. But um, I think what's really important is to just get clear on what's your priority. Where's your allegiance? Is your allegiance to your to do list? Or is your allegiance to your evolution? And for me, my allegiance is to my evolution. And so, you know, I'm constantly faced with trade offs of like, worldly responsibility or like, hey, go and sit with this thing that just triggered you. And having that clear priority makes it easy for me to know what I'm going to do. And so for me, you know, I start, I usually start my day with my practices that usually takes one to two hours. And then I move through my day and then I use my day for my spiritual growth. And so like, and as things come up, You know, I, the prioritization just makes it easy where my focus needs to be if I can. And if I can't do something in the moment, I'll, you know, go and sit with it or be with it later. And so I'm constantly faced with trade-offs of like feed the limited self, move into the expansive self throughout the day. And you just, you just use those. And there comes a point in, you know, it's very common it sounds like you might be going through this where it's like you had a very external orientation and then you pen the pendulum swings to a very internal orientation. And then eventually that inner transformation wants to express outward. It's like, we are meant to all just sit in the house and meditate and read spiritual books all day. And the way that shows up is inspiration. And so all of a sudden you will start to feel inspiration to do things and even potentially a genuine desire to serve. And I say genuine because a lot of people do service because it's because they should. And that's really just the ego. It's like, oh, I should give back or like, I'm going to give back because I'm a good person or I'm spiritual now. So I'm going to be a teacher. Like it's just different from the emergence of your priority becoming serving what you see in the world around you. And so at that point, you start to be excited about being an actor in the world. 
but still maintaining the allegiance. And, you know, I think a big difference between those, when the, when the emergence comes and you move back into the world is you just start to be more in flow. And so like, I could be doing something, but then like, I get this inner experience, even though it doesn't make sense to go do this other thing or to go be with my baby or whatever. And I just follow it. And so I'm just in the flow of life moving based on what's, what's unfolding and arising in the moment versus like, okay, I did my spiritual practices. Now I'm going to do my work. Like that compartmentalization just isn't there. And you know, that, that process of moving into that, that is, that takes, that takes time. It, it takes, it takes, you know, it's still something I'm learning how to do and getting better at each day. But that's, that's a common arc that I've seen with lots of people. This reminds me of the question that you actually were asking yourself, which is, do we really have free will or, or we don't? And it's something that I'm spending a considerable amount of time thinking about lately. It feels like if you ignore what's actually really inside you that pulls you in a certain direction, you can do so, but you will do so at great cost uh, and great suffering. Uh, and so it's no choice at all, it seems like. What, what are your thinking on that? So I think um, most people, so there's like different stages of experience. So like most people think they have free will, but what they actually are is just like a ball of patterns. So like they're responding and meeting life from emanations of their imprinting and ego that they didn't choose. And so like, they're kind of like robots, but they don't know it. And that's why people talk about like, oh, this person's awake, like, oh, wait, so I'm not my programming. Okay, cool. Now I have more agency. And then there's also the notion of you have, you're an eternal being that came here for a specific purpose. And you call it like your soul plan or whatever. And you're correct that as you deviate from that, life can be more difficult. You know, it's like shit starts getting hard when you're out of alignment. And so I do think when you move past that experience of being identified as the ego and the thoughts versus like the experiencer, you still there's still kind of like this, these forces of reality of your higher self that are kind of like moving you, nudging you, right? And you do have free will whether to, to follow those or not. But what you may observe is that one way seems to be more supportive of your life than the other. And the paradox of it is, is that you actually like what a lot of people just don't realize is that they're that eternal part of themselves wants the best for them. And so like what eventually you come to see is that following that path of alignment, following the inner guidance, it's actually just the best thing to do because that's who you really are. And you would never set up a game for yourself that that doesn't move you towards your highest expression. And so the part that resists following that is just the ego again. And, you know, it's the false self. And so, yes, you do have some free will. And I think, but there's also these other forces that are at play. And for me, it's just aligning to my higher self is how I choose my free will because it just is the, makes my life the best it can be. Scott, I would really like to thank you for, for this conversation and for, for the time you know, that we had together and what you shared very openly. I have, if I may, one last question to ask you. 
And that is related to the relationship with consciousness, awareness, and the rise of uh, of AI. In you know, in a world where AI is getting increasingly smarter, and no, we're not. You know, I'm not talking yet about AGI or stuff like that, but you know. Computers are getting smarter and they will be able increasingly to know you better than you know yourself. How does a human being navigate that? Especially because uh, what I'm thinking of is that with AI expanding and taking over more and more responsibility and tasks, we're going to go through a period of time in which there are most probably going to be a lot of jobs lost, right? And, and jobs and what you do in life is a huge source of meaning for people, of how they find significance in their life. Before, it used to be religion, you know, and then it was work for a lot of people that are not religious. So like in Latin you will say ora et labora, pray and work, right? So as modern time progresses, uh, we progressively took away the ora, the pray, and now we're taking away the labora, the work. So what's left? Well, you know, I guess the, I guess implicit in that question is that you think that AI is not going to make humans more able to do things they like because some people believe that yeah ai is going to take a bunch of people's jobs so that humans can do stuff that are more fun or more fulfilling or more interesting you know and i don't know like i personally don't find it productive to really think about these things because i believe my highest goal in this lifetime is self-realization it's consciousness. It's not having an important job. I think the job supports my consciousness work, not my consciousness work supports my job. And so I was just having a conversation with someone that was like, man, like how do people that don't have financial resources even do spirituality? Cause like they don't have time and that's a really interesting point to this conversation because if we were able to have an AI improve the overall welfare of like, like not needing our societies, not needing for everyone to work, then like more people might have a chance to do stuff like this. So I actually think, like what I believe is like the universe is intelligent and the universe has a prerogative to move people, more people towards self-realization. And so I trust that. Like, you know what I mean? If all these people, it's like COVID, it's like all these people go into some type of identity crisis and a lot of people wake up. So if all these people that had their whole meaning was their some role they created for themselves that isn't really their true identity around being a certain type of job person. And all of a sudden they go, well, what the fuck am I actually? That's actually a good thing, I think, for the world. Scott, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your experience. Is there anything before we wrap up that you would like to share with the audience or things that I haven't asked you that you think are important to touch upon? No, I think the important thing is to know is everyone is on their own journey. Everyone's journey is different. Everything I shared today is just my journey. And, you know, I genuinely wish everyone deep wellness on their own. And thank you for sharing that. We will leave in the show notes and the description of the YouTube video all your contacts, as well as the link to to your podcast and your and your newsletter. Thank you so much again, and for listeners, we'll see you next time. Bye.
That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.